we're going to share them. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to just kick off this session and just with a very brief overview of uh, landscape uh, overview of biodata infrastructure within Australia and beyond. Um, next slide, please. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we're meeting today and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, for you in Nipaluna, um, that's the Mawinina and Palawa peoples, and I'm joining you today from Mianjin, um, the traditional home of the Yagara and Turrbal peoples. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just gonna give a, a, a very uh, quick overview of the biodata and biodata infrastructure landscape within Australia. I'm really going to focus, I guess, on who funds the production of this data and how many of these resources may there be out there. I'm going to very briefly touch on the fact that global and uh, they global resources uh, complement the ones in Australia. We're all part of a complex ecosystem and just briefly touch on sustainability challenges to get us thinking for the discussion at the end. Next slide, please. So before I kick off, I'll just briefly explain uh, who, I, who I am and where I'm from. So I'm the Deputy Director of the Australian Biocommons. We are uh, funded through the uh, Federal Australian Government through a program called NCRIS, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, through funds that come to an organisation called Bioplatforms Australia. And it's Bioplatforms Australia mission to develop uh, uh, data infrastructure to support omics data um, in research. So in the BioCommons, it's our mission to support whole of life science research communities in what we call digital scale infrastructure. We work with a lot of partners to deploy services. Um, so researchers across the country can use them free of charge, fully subsidized. And we also provide some training and support solutions. Next slide, please. Um, in Australia, um, just a, a, an, an idea of the scale of, of uh, life science research we're talking about. So we know that about a third of Australian publicly funded grant holders are focused on the life sciences, and that's about 30,000 PIs. Next slide, please. They roughly, uh, I guess half of them are focused on human, uh, human related research, human health, and um, about 30% in agriculture and 20% in environmental sciences. Next slide, please. So. Our approach at the BioCommons is that we have been engaging communities through broad thematic areas. And to date, these have mostly been, you can see examples here on the screen of some bioinformatics methodologies such as genome assembly, annotation, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, talking to these communities, surveying them about their challenges and holding online fora. Um, finding out what the challenges are, and then we document what we hear in what we call an infrastructure roadmap for Australia. Next slide, please. And then we work with partners um, around the country to deploy services. I'm not going to go into too much detail about these now, but Catherine Hall is going to fill us in on one of these AGA later. Next slide, please. Um, so I guess when we think about d data, and I actually like the term digital assets because I think um, uh, data is important, biological data, but also there's a lot of reusable other digital assets that are reusable, such as um, software and workflows that we need to think about. So, you know, everybody here will know that in current life science data practice and, and uh, the digital assets are associated with all parts of the research life cycle. When we're um, planning uh, experiments and, and work programs, we're definitely aware of the data that's going to be uh, generated. We uh, collect digital information from numerous instruments um, at the beginning of uh, projects. We process it in order so it, for it can be analysed. And then hopefully um, after this, the, the data, both the raw and the analysed data is preserved. And we would hope that um, this data is made available um, in formats that, so it can be found and shared with others so it can be reused. Next slide, please. So, uh, and next slide. So I'm just going to start off with, I guess, a, a brief overview of, of who funds research data production in Australia. So this is some information from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Um, it's their latest report. It's a number of years old, but you can see here that um, uh, government funding in this country, 65% of funding comes from the Commonwealth and 35% comes from various states and territories. Next slide, please. This infographic is from uh, a recent uh, document from N the NCRIS, it's the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap, but what it's showing is a, is a split of the research, the Commonwealth research funding um, in Australia. Um, it's probably a bit hard to see, but um, the, like the, 
what I'm highlighting here is, I guess, the boxes that represent uh, funding through to life science. So um, the first one you probably can't see, but it's actually tax incentive, so not, not really relevant here. But um, of the organisations and groups I've highlighted here, you can see that CSIRO um, uh, attracts a large amount of Commonwealth investment. Of course, this is not all for life science, it's across all areas. But then we move down um, and we can see that the NHMRC um, attracts significant funding, also the Australian Research Council. And then we have some other, other medical research future fund and then other groups that are also focused on life science generation. Next slide, please. So it's considerable budget um, spent on life science research. Um, this is showing, uh, I guess, a spread across the state. The states, again, this is from the uh, same report from the Bureau of Statistics. Uh, the left is showing the spread between each state. Obviously, uh, there's a mix there, probably uh, roughly proportionate to population. What I'm showing you on the right is the, uh, the field of research that uh, the states are funding. And the, the bars that are highlighted with the, with the pink asterisks are the life science related. So a good chunk of that research funding is going to life sciences in this country. Next slide, please. <clears throat> There's also a pretty significant amount of funding that comes from nonprofit, um, uh, private nonprofit resources. Um, and that's uh, the numbers are shown here on the slide. I think what's interesting, uh, just at the bottom, you can see that um, there's actually a, a pretty significant amount of gov Commonwealth government funds going into that research um, funding as well. Next slide. Um, so I guess what I really wanted to, I guess, comment on here is that, you know, a, a digital approach is so tightly linked to modern research practice that we can expect that pretty much all of those research projects that are funded, that that the funding is touching on from the previous are producing data and digital assets. So it's really it's really key. Um, and whilst we think, I guess, sometimes about uh, biodata resources being uh, large, uh, well-organized repositories and databases, there is data coming out of pretty much all research these days. Next slide, please. So um, if we're thinking about Australia and the world, how many biodata resources might there be out there? Um, you know, how can we find this out? So next slide. Our first, our first um, way we can do this is to look to global registries. So I'm pointing to a website here called Fair Sharing. It started off its life called um, BioSharing. It's a registry of databases around the world. Um, when we search this for life science, it incorporates both repositories and knowledge bases. You can see that there's uh, well uh, over one and a half thousand life science uh, databases registered in this repository and there's 56 uh, that are based in Australia. Uh, next slide. There are of course other ways to try and gauge how many resources there are out there and I think Guy's probably going to talk to bit this uh, shortly in a bit more detail but uh, recently the Global Biodata Coalition has done a uh, an approach where they've uh, look to the literature and try to identify biodata resources who have published a paper. Um, and using this methodology, there's over 3,000 globally and 51 in Australia. Next slide. Um, in Australia, we also have some other, I guess, uh, registries at our disposal to try and get a handle on this. Um, I'm showing a screen capture here of, of Research Data Australia, which uh, is a, a, a repository that's hosted by the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, and that includes uh, registries of data resources across all fields of research. And also um, the, the, the records are in there are coming from over 100 Australian research organisations, government agencies and cultural institutions. Uh, next slide. So if we search this for some common terms that are uh, biologically relevant, uh, uh, some examples are shown here. So you can see genome, 917 records in there. Next slide. Um, I think metabolome is nine and next slide, uh, proteomics is over a thousand. So these are pretty uh, variable numbers. Next slide. And I guess um, the when we're looking in uh, repositories like this, it's, it's important to realise that this is actually a mix of data assets that may be held in institutional data repositories or they might be uh, fully uh, you know, full-blown sort of standalone data repositories and knowledge bases. So this, these numbers do include relatively small data sets and, and collections. It's also worth noting that of those, of those um, uh, resources described in here, not, not all of those have been maintained. So there are some dead links. So that's interesting to talk about um, in our sustainability section. 
Next slide. Um, on the topic of sustainability, um, I thought it's probably best not for me to reflect my own opinions here or my own thoughts, but to reflect on some uh, points that have been uh, raised by uh, the Australian research community. So uh, earlier in this year, we held a webinar. Um, Guy from GBC was present, but we also had uh, a number of uh, uh, researchers, Christine, Johannes and David, who are pictured on the slide here, talk about their uh, experiences of building up and then trying to sustain biodata resources. So I think the key points coming out of that webinar was that all of those resources were originally built to support a specific research project. Obviously, that research project was funded, um, but all of them have found a, have had utility for and are being or have been used by a much wider global audience. So there is a there's value in the data and it's reused by others. Um, what they've found is that, you know, when their original funding round ends, they obviously need to apply for more funding. Um, depending on the, the nature of that particular grant, it often requires agility to focus or refocus on the, the main purpose of the data, uh, uh, data resource to focus on that new project. Um, all of them are absolutely sustained by a mixture of resources. They all get degrees of institutional support, effectively in kind, um, particularly around the sysadmin and compute side of things. Um, I think uh, a common thing was that institutional funding is increasingly being squeezed. And in all of them, they've been, they've been sustained for periods by goodwill. So effectively by uh, researchers associated with these uh, re resources using their core or lab funding, which is um, uh, problematic. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just gonna end on, I guess, just the concept that, and this is framing the conversation or framing the scene for Catherine's talk, that we, we of course, sit in an interconnect, interconnected global ecosystem. Next slide. Um, of course, one, re one instance that's uh, obvious to everyone in this conference is GBIF. Um, and that obviously is hosted through a, a, a centralized uh, a group that's in Denmark. Next slide, please. From Australia, there are records of species occurrence who are uh, fed to GBIF from the Atlas of Living Australia. Atlas of Living Australia in turn is aggregating data from or species occurrence records from all across the country, from numerous state-based organizations and others. Next slide. Um, but this information then, of course, once it's fed up to GBIF is available globally for the, the whole world to use. Next slide. Um, and next slide. <laughs> Another great example, I guess, from the molecular space is the uh, long-standing collaboration to build an international nucleotide sequence database. And that is a collaboration between ENA in Europe, um, of which Guy is one of the co-leads, the Jap uh, DNA database of Japan and the SRA in the US. So these... Uh, these uh, repositories exchange data, um, raw reads and assemblies. Next slide. Um, I thought I'd just, I thought something that we could possibly think about when we're in the discussion section is just to think about, um, you know, in the US particularly, I think there's a, there is a, a move to, to, to make data available through uh, commercial uh, cloud resources, which is, which is obviously gives, enables it to be accessed in numerous ways. Next slide. Um, and, you know, of course, there are, we know that there are many uh, Australian researchers who uh, generate data. They have local copies here and then they sub at the point of, of publication or before they submit data to these international repositories. Next slide. Um, they also uh, retrieve, sorry, the arrows are very small. They also retrieve regularly data from these international repositories for analysis here in Australia in, through various computational systems. Next slide but are increasingly accessing these data in the in the commercial cloud directly. So that's just, a, I guess, a very, very brief uh, overview of, of, I guess, some interconnectedness globally. And next slide. Um, and that really, I guess, uh, will frame the uh, discussion, I think, for Catherine, who is gonna talk to us about Argo, which is a resource that utilizes a mix of both existing onshore and offshore data infrastructures. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll just go straight to Catherine's talk. So could we cue that up, please?
Thanks so much, Jeff. You um, covered a lot of the preamble for me. So hopefully when I start to talk about the Australian Reference Genome Atlas, also known as AGA, um, I won't have to, we'll be able to skip through some of the beginning materials um, and get on to how we've sort of gone about building it. Um, so I work at the Atlas of Living Australia, but as Jeff mentioned, um, the Australian Reference Genome Atlas Project has been built in partnership with the Australian BioCommons and also BioPlatforms Australia. And BioPlatforms Australia also has a dual role for us as being um, a very large repository for genomics data that we're incorporating into the Genome Atlas. Um, we also have some additional funding from the um, Australian Research Data Council, ARDC, and that's around the Bushfires project there. They have the Bushfire Data Commons. The reason they've partnered with us on this project was because one of the aims of ARGA is not just to aggregate genomics data, which hopefully it does, um, but it's also to help people explore that data in context. So we're really familiar with, uh, if you're a genomics biologist, which um, you may or may not be, but 